Thanks to all of you for joining. Uh, as Steve said, I'm Paul Fain. I was an editor at Inside Higher Ed, uh, where for a long time I oversaw our coverage of non-traditional students, including veterans and active duty members of the military, uh, federal policy, for-profit colleges, and community colleges, among other things. So that's why I'm here. We are fortunate today to be joined by Jason Delisle, a visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, uh, who works on higher education financing with an emphasis on student loan programs, a great source of mine in my IHE days as well. Uh, Jason and Cody Christensen, his colleague at AEI, are co-authors of the new report we're discussing today, Collateral Damage, Why an Expanded 90-10 Rule is a Misguided Policy for Protecting Military Students. As most of you know, I'm sure the so-called 90-10 rule is a federal requirement that all for-profit colleges, not um, other sectors, <clears throat> receive at least 10% of their revenue from sources other than the federal government. But that cap on federal funding does not include military education benefits, uh, those from the GI Bill or the Defense Tuition Assistance Program. It turns out this is a very timely discussion maybe even more than Jason and his co-author thought, uh, the coronavirus relief bill that Congress is currently mulling would include all federal sources, uh, potentially under that 90% cap, including veterans and, and active duty uh, education benefits. Uh, Congress also debated changes to 9010 in the December stimulus, but those proposals didn't make it into the final bill. And also reportedly, uh, according to Michael Stratford at Politico and others, um, on the table would be changing the rule to 85-15, an 85-15 split. Um, so I'm going to ask Jason some questions about his paper. As, as Steve said, we'll leave plenty of time at the end for you to ask questions in the Q&A tab you see at the bottom there. Um, but Jason, before we get to the findings and, and um, kind of what you sought to add with the paper, I thought we'd do a little background on 90-10 and the kind of philosophy that led to its rise and where things stand now in accountability discussions. Can you give us a little background on how this came to pass? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the basics of it are that, um, you know, in the in the 80s, in the 1980s and early 1990s, you know, there was a lot of concern over sort of fly by night for profit institutions um, that were just simply taking advantage of the federal student aid program, students were getting grants and loans, um, and those institutions were, you know, essentially just there taking in that money, taking in those students and not providing very much, if anything at all, in return. Um, and so it sparked a series of reforms um, around ad addressing these sort of what people call predatory institutions. Um, and uh, one of them is the cohort default rate, which is that you know institutions where students have a very high rate of non-repayment on their student loans um, would lose eligibility for the federal student aid programs. And another, and, and that one is probably the most widely known. It applies to all institutions, public, private, for-profit, um, and it's sort of widely covered. The another one to come out of those series of reforms is, is this so-called 90-10 rule, which limits the amount of revenue that a for-profit college can receive from um, the, de the Department of Education student aid program. And that's really important for today's discussion, right? This, is, this was something that was very much so driven by, uh, these reforms were driven by the education committees um, in Congress, which had jurisdiction over the Department of Education program. So Pell Grants, Stafford loans, so 9010, the 9010 rule said, you know, these institutions should really only be able to get um, no more than 90% of their revenue from these Department of Education programs. Um, I wasn't following these issues in the early, in the late 80s and early 1990s. Um, but my sense is that, and this is, you know, this seems to be the discussion in, in the policy circles today, is that the assumption was that the 90-10 limitation that, you know, limiting revenue to 90% from federal aid programs, um, you know, institutions that receive more than that, well, that was a sort of, that was a red flag. That was an indicator that these institutions um, were the kind of predatory institutions and were engaged in the kind of practices that Congress was trying to 
end. Um, so, and, you know, we still have that rule. Uh, it's still in place today. How does the, uh, I, I promise I'm going to ask about the paper, but uh, how does the, the skin in the game argument kind of then and now play into the philosophy here? Um, so the skin in the game argument uh, is, is really um, one that is essentially uh, students need to put their own money towards the education. Um, and that they, you know, so if you're receiving federal aid, a grant and a student loan, and that covers your full cost of attendance, um, then you haven't put any of your own money towards the education. So you have, as I say, no skin in the game. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, that argument, which, you know, I mean, there's some merit to it, which is that, uh, you know, if, if you're not willing to put any of your own money towards this education, um, then maybe that really is one of these fly by night kind of operations uh, where they're saying, no, 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 don't even, don't even worry about coming up with your own money. We're just interested. We're just, and from the institution's point, we're just interested in the federal money and we won't even set our tuition. We'll set it exactly at the full amount of the federal money. Um, so th this is, you know, some of the thinking is that if, that some of the justification, I don't know if it was justification at the time that 9010 was created. It is certainly one of the justifications that you see out there now for maintaining 9010 um, is that, you know, students, it is an indicator that the, this institution is good or uh, of you know, acceptable levels of quality that people are willing to put up their own money. Um, another sort of permutation of this argument and justification for 9010 that you hear is that um, it, the skin in the game is that it doesn't necessarily have to be every student has some of their own money uh, at risk, just that on average or that in total, um, that there are some students who might be full pay or some students who might be half pay uh, rather than entirely using federal aid. And that's another indication that this institution, this is the argument, that this institution doesn't exist solely to sort of stop up student aid money uh, from the Department of Education. Uh, and, you know, so those are, those are the, the, that's the sort of skin in the game uh, argument. I point out in the paper, um, I think what's really interesting is the sort of the, the dichotomy between the argument for skin in the game and how important that is as an indication of quality is happening on a parallel track. That, that argument is happening on a parallel track with the argument for free college, which is that we shouldn't be expecting students to put in anything. Um, when it comes to higher education, if it's at a public university, because any amount is too much. That's why we need free, which is, I mean, it, it, it's sort of, it's hard for me to reconcile um, those two very different contemporary, very contemporary uh, arguments in, in higher ed policy. Absolutely. Well, thanks for the context there. It's really helpful. So what drew you to doing this now? Uh, and, and, you know, you mentioned in the paper that uh, Brookings and Mark Kantritz and others have looked at this before. And what do you hope that the paper adds to the literature? Um, yeah, I think, you know, a few things. Uh, you know, first of all, I think that this discussion around 9010, and also, I mean, we're talking about, obviously, we'll get to this about modifying 9010 so that it includes military benefits like GI Bill. Um, but so far, we've mainly just talked about 9010 um, by itself. Um, you know, there have been, I think that the, the policy, just what I've noticed, you know, over the years is that the policy discussion around 9010 is, is very, very one-sided. Um, it is very much so driven um, by an advocacy community that is in favor of 9010 and is highly critical of for-profit colleges. Um, and uh, I think the, the sort of the research that gets talked about and the research agenda that gets, that gets developed um, it, it is very much so uh, in that sort of 
uh, aligned with that agenda or, or with that agenda um, as context. So what I was interested in was, you know, are there, um, we have this sort of movement that's been going on for 10 years now that is, is and it's a good one, which is a sort of a political movement and a, a policy movement towards you know, collecting and publishing more data on outcomes of students at individual colleges and even, and even programs within individual colleges. And this movement, I think we can really trace the start of this to the, the gainful employment regulations that the Department of Education put out under the Obama administration. Um, and, you know, this was the first time we got to see earnings of students at particular colleges because of the gainful employment regulations. And then that is probably closely linked to the development of the college scorecard, um, which is also, you know, which is not just for for-profit colleges and, and career and certificate programs, but all institutions that are taking federal aid. Um, so my, you know, to sort of get to your question of well, why, what's the interest in the paper? Where did this come from? Um, I, I was really curious to see how outcomes at for-profit colleges that, that would be affected by reforms to 9010, how they stacked up um, to, to other colleges. And I also, you know, I also sort of have felt over the years as I've watched the debate and I've watched people make arguments in favor of 9010, I felt that that was really out of step with this movement towards more data and better data on student outcomes. Because the 9010 rule has nothing to do with student outcomes. It doesn't include student outcomes. In fact, it's, it's agnostic to student outcomes, which is the problem. Um, and that's sort of what we were driving at. What I was interested in the paper is I thought, well, in theory, because 9010 is agnostic to student outcomes, it's just a revenue test, you know, it's essentially an accounting test. In theory, um, there should be institutions that have outcomes that are, are perfectly acceptable or maybe even above average or maybe even excellent in the for-profit space that we can now see because of this data being available. But those, those would exist and in theory could fail a 90-10 rule. Um, which would, you know, and, and that, so that was sort of the theory that, that I was interested in and testing. And I felt like it was one that people in the, in the policy discussions were avoiding. So for example, you know, um, a, a paper by Adam Looney at the Brookings Institution um, is, is widely cited in the advocacy community um, in, in making the case for 9010, because his argument um, is that, you know, 9010 is, correlated with high student loan default rates. So student institutions that have, that are close to violating, closer to violating the 90-10 rule uh, also tend to have weaker outcomes uh, on student loan default rates. Um, so I thought, well, but it seems like um, there, there's more, there are more outcomes out there than cohort default rates. And this is my point, this was the whole, all of the work that the advocacy community has done, great work that they've done to get more data out there about these outcomes, not just cohort defaults. So what does it look like when you use those? And the other piece that I think this adds that I thought was missing from, from Adam Looney's great, it's a great paper, where I thought was missing though was, we don't know what the outcomes are at public colleges. Um, it's not a good comparison there. Uh, and I mean, in theory, I mean, that's what we should be comparing the for-profit colleges to is we shouldn't be comparing them to some standard, you know, comparing them amongst themselves or some standard that someone, we should be comparing them also to public institution. I mean, because in theory, those are the institutions that, um, that uh, students who would be forced out of for-profit colleges, that they might attend those. Um, so I, I think, so that's, that was kind of the impetus was, well, let's, let's update some of this. Let's look at this so we can see the date, so we can see student outcomes data at for-profit colleges, um, that, that 
might fail reforms under 9010 and, and, and add the new outcomes data that we have available because of the college scorecard. And also let's add in what public colleges, what do public colleges look like on these outcomes? So that, so that was really what we were after. And I think how this fits in with the, with the, other, the other research. There's another paper out there by uh, Mark Kantrowitz um, that um, is, is, a, is more critical of 9010 than the Brookings Institution paper by Adam Looney. Um, it, and, uh, but it, it is old enough that it sort of predates this big boom and explosion in student outcomes data that, that we have so readily available now. And so it sort of builds on both of those studies, I think, um, uh, in that regard. Yeah, and I mean, beyond, you know, having more outcomes data, I think it's safe to say that the cohort default rate is not often considered the best measure of, of quality for a lot of reasons. So let's get to the findings. So you you ran this, uh, the change through and looked at what would happen with for-profits and then also public. So let, uh, you, if you want to start with the for-profits and what you found? Yeah, so, so what we did um, sort of basically and simply was we said, well, because the, the sort of the big reform that everybody that is sort of on the table in terms of 90-10, and there, there are really two. One is one is limiting it now to 15% of revenue. So we both 85, 15, but 15, I'm sorry, the 85% of revenue could be earned from uh, the federal student aid program, the Department of Education program, not 90. So a tighter, a tighter rule essentially in that regard. Uh, but the other is then including uh, military benefits. So GI Bill benefits and DOD, really all federal benefits, but those are the two, those are big, uh, particularly the GI Bill benefits, which aren't counted currently. So what does it look like when you add those in as a source of revenue that would be subject to this restriction under 9010 and under 8515? This is very much so a live debate reform, um, a live reform in Congress right now, as you mentioned, at the, at the beginning. So we have data on what colleges, what the for-profit sector currently looks like under 9010, how much revenue they currently get. Um, and and um, we simply added in the um, revenue from the uh, veterans benefits, GI Bill benefits and the DOD and DOD benefits. And we sort of, Reran the 90-10 tests uh, to see how many institutions that currently pass it would fail it once you made this reform that included the military benefit. And then we also ran it doing 85-15 in, and included the military benefit. So that, uh, you know, uh, using that methodology, and we, and we used, I think our data is from, you can actually go to the EP's website and download the spreadsheet that we generated to do the analysis. And you can also, it, it has a tab for all the sources so you can go and, and look at them and, and uh, come up with all sorts of reasons why we should have changed it just slightly. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, but what we found was that, you know, um, a, 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 a not insignificant number um, of institutions would, would fail under, this, under these reforms, would fail a new 90-10 test. Now, we did it for one year, Technically, 90-10 is a two-year test. And we also are sort of, you know, this is a sort of static state of the world. Obviously, uh, if um, this rule were put in place, institutions would change their behavior. I mean, that's the, that's the idea is that we want them to change their behavior. I think sometimes for sort of wasteful and um, not very effective ways, but they want them, the people advocating for this policy want formal colleges to change their behavior. Uh, but I think, you know, the, and, we, and we list some of the institutions there. Um, so, when the, the, so we sort of run it three ways. So we do this big thing. You can see all the data on a spreadsheet. But then we sort of ran it three different ways and talked about that in the paper. The first way we ran it was averaging. So what is the average of the, of the for-profit institutions that would fail this reform uh, with the GI Bill benefits and military benefits in 9010? And 8515, what do the, the average student outcomes look like among the failers? 
Uh, and then on, on four metrics, we looked at cohort default rate. Um, we looked at student loan repayment rate. Those are different and you can get into the details in the paper. Um, we looked at, we used an earnings data and, the, and all of this comes from the college scorebook. And we also used uh, a graduation or a completion rate metric. And we lined that up with public colleges. So among the fifth, and we lined that up with public colleges under two categories. What, what is the median public institution reporting on those statistics in the college scorecard. So by median, I, we mean at, at the point at half. So you line up half the institutions. We didn't enrollment weight, right? So people will ask about that. I'm sure that's a quibble. We didn't enrollment weight. Um, so half the public institutions, what is the statistic reported right at the midpoint? And then we looked at the bottom 20% of public institutions. And, I, and bottom 20%, what I mean by that is what is the statistic at the 20th percentile? So 20% of public institutions are reporting the student outcome at this level or worse. Um, and what is that level? Right? So what is that cohort default rate? What is that student earnings rate, et cetera? And what we, what we found is that, you know, the, among the for-profit institutions that fail, particularly you know, fail a 90-10 or an 85-15 test, after you add in military benefits, the student outcomes there don't look you know, a, a lot different. In many cases, they're better. In some cases, they're about the same. And in a few cases, they're slightly worse. Then, then the 20% of public institutions with the weakest student outcomes. Um, so, and, and our, our point here um, really is that uh, the argument for 90-10, particularly in the Brookings Institution paper and what you'll hear from advocates is that, look, it's okay that this is just, a, this is an accounting test. We're really just interested, but we're really interested in student outcomes. And it turns out that our accounting test, 90-10, is a pretty good predictor of student outcomes. Um, so, you know, again, would I say, well, then why not just use the student outcome? <laughs> it's not 1990 anymore, right? I mean, that's just use the outcome there. But you're looking for something that is a good predictor of X. You look for something that's a good predictor of X when you, you can't just look at X, in this case, student outcomes. But you have all that data now. So, so anyway, so the, the other point here, though, is around the public institutions is that the, so if you follow, if you buy this argument that 90-10 is a good predictor of, of, of you know, bad outcomes and, you know, um, among four problems, and it is true, you can see that in the data, you can see that in our first table, that it is true, we find as well, like Adam Looney did at the Brookings Institution, that the institutions that would fail 90-10 under these military benefit reforms do have weaker student outcomes on average than the, the for profits that don't fail. It's just that their outcomes don't look that bad relative to about 325 public institutions. They're about the same. Um, so, so that's you know, and th that's where I that's where I also sort of lose. I sort of start to you know question the argument for 9010 is if it's a way of weeding out weaker performing institutions you're still left with all these public institutions that have similarly weak outcomes, student outcomes, which in theory, the, the veterans that you steer away from these for-profit colleges with your 90-10 reforms, they could very well end up at those public institutions that have the same kinds of outcomes. So that's why, you know, I just, I'm, I'm less convinced after doing this study about the merits of the 90-10 argument, I think than I was even, even before. Is a part of a possible takeaway as I listen to you that you know we need outcomes based metrics that will capture poor performing publics as well. Yeah, I mean, so that's why I say you know if if nine if, if there's so much so much ink was spilled and so much so much breath was wasted arguing that well look ninety ten is a good proxy for colleges with weak outcomes. That's my point. Then just measure the outcomes. You don't need to do the accounting test. And that's the, that's the other thing with, with our, and, and in fact, 90-10 is even worse than that because 
what we show, and this is in the final table in our paper, um, is that there are for-profit institutions with, with really good outcomes. There, some of them are small, um, with really good outcomes, offering niche programs, um, a lot of it trade-related, um, in local labor, labor markets, and they're going to get nailed by these changes, proposed changes to 9010, even though they have good outcomes. And this is my point at the beginning: is that 9010 is agnostic to student outcomes. I mean, and in theory, we always thought before, in theory, it could, you know, harm a school that has good outcomes. Well, it's not just in theory anymore. Now we know that it would do that. Um, so let me let me ask quickly, though. You know, for those who feel like an over reliance on federal funds is a problem in itself. Yeah. Um, you know, couldn't some of these higher performing for profits that would be captured under a, a tightened rule find some other students, uh, you know, tweak their programs? I mean, deal with this in a way that would, would leave intact the quality of their offerings. Yeah. And I, yeah, and that, and that is an argument that I've heard is that, you know, one way they, they could do this is go find other students, you know, go, then don't be so reliant on. But I, I guess I just, what I don't understand about that argument is um, why would you, why do they need to go do that? Their outcomes are good. In fact, it, I almost wanted to say, you know, if their outcomes are good, who cares how much federal aid they're getting? In fact, great. Um, you know, I think it's great that they're enrolling students that receive a lot of federal aid if they have these, if they have these good outcomes. Um, and so it seems um, sort of wasteful to me to say, go out and find other students that don't fit this category because of an accounting test that Congress created that doesn't care about your student outcomes. And, yeah, and you know, it, it, I mean, it's the classic kind of thing that like, you know, that, that really rankles people about you know, dumb things their government does. I mean, you can imagine people within the college being like, we, we are a great college. We've got great outcomes. Yeah, but we can't, we can't take that many of these students. Well, why? Well, there's a rule in Washington that says it has to be this much and not that much. And, it, it, you know, it's just, and so now you're just following rules and checking boxes that aren't really related to the, the point of the policy in the first place, which is supposed to be about your outcomes, which are good. Um, the other thing is, there's a lot of complaining about for-profit colleges aggressively recruiting military students for the benefits. But when you say, well, go find other students to make your numbers work, um, then really what the institution is going to do then is aggressively recruit somebody else. In fact, you've now given them an incentive maybe to aggressively recruit when they weren't aggressively recruiting before. It's just a different group that they have to aggressively recruit now to comply. And now they're doing it to comply with some rule. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that that's, that's particularly um, problematic as well. And again, to your, back to your question of like, just measure the outcome. Now, here's, now the cynic in me, I, and, and, and I haven't mentioned this yet, but the cynic in me is why, yeah, why not just measure, some people are wondering, right? Why not just measure the student outcome? And, and, and this is another reason why we did this study, is that I think the reason why we won't just, the advocacy community and many don't want, many critics of for-profit colleges don't want to just look at outcomes. They want to use something like 9010. is because if you look just at outcomes, like, I've, like we've highlighted in this paper, there are public institutions with outcomes that are, are on a similar level to for-profit colleges. And so if your accountability system just looks at student outcomes, it is going to uh, ding and catch a significant number of public colleges, particularly the community colleges. And so if your agenda is to have an accountability system that only hurts for-profit colleges, uh, you can't have it be based only on student outcomes. <laughs> because it won't only hurt for-profit colleges. So here we are talking about arcane and obscure accounting rules uh, developed you know, decades ago um, 
as the preferred way to measure uh, the quality of a college. You know, I think it's just, and that's, and that's I think, what, the, you know, what people are after. Um, and, and then now, you know, and then now, and now I'm, I'm hearing, you know, organizations talk about wanting to measure how much money is spent on instruction, which is another accounting test. And I can tell you why I think they're after accounting tests, right? It's the same thing for 9010, is that we need a test that isn't student outcomes based uh, and hurts for profit. So, you know, the outcomes debate tends to get stuck on the shoals of capturing colleges or programs that folks don't want to capture. Um, you can ask the Obama administration's ratings plans for how to set that up. And, but, you know, it, to speak to the, the non-cynic in you, Jason, uh, do, we, do we have yeah. good enough data to create a system that could largely do what we want to do and protect veterans or active duty military uh, benefits as well? Yeah, I mean, I think you can, you know, and people are, are out there pushing for this, like you can establish a floor. Um, Based on on student outcomes, you and you can you know you can use earnings. Um, uh, you can use you know again. I mean, there are you, there are a, a lot of people on the right who say I think that gainful employment regulation on the Obama administration was fine. I just wanted it applied to all institutions. Um, you know, so I think that there is uh, you know I I think that the that this whole idea of using earnings data. Um, and and loan repayment also, um, I, I think it does create the opportunities for a, a different sort of accountability regime that is based on those that applies to all institutions. Um, I, not many people are really proposing that yet very seriously. And, but I think you can, I think the problem is not so much that is the data available, well, I think that's actually been the sort of triumph of the past 10 years is that we're showing that it is uh, and we can do it. Now, it's flawed and a little bit risky. And, you know, like, I think one of the interesting things to come out of this in working with Veterans Education Project was, you know, I, I'm showing them some of the data that I'm pulling down and, and you know, and, and a lot of it's missing. And, and they ask, Where's, where, why is this missing? And, well, that's, that's what comes out of the college scorecard. And, you know, I just got the sense from them, which I think is widely, you know, shared in the community that all, you know, the data is right and good and comprehensive and we can trust it. <laughs> but the more and more you work with it, uh, you start to get a little bit nervous about how much faith we should put in it just for those reasons. But I think, you know, we've made a lot of progress and structurally um, we, we can do that. Now, the thing that, the community, the policy community is wrestling with, and it is not one that is a sort of data limitation or that we just haven't thought of the right way to do this yet, but it is very much so a thorny sort of political and values problem. Um, that is, uh, and, and the for-profit framing this in terms of for-profits allows people to sort of skirt this problem, which is that weak student outcomes tend to be correlated with student demographics. And they tend to be heavily correlated with selectivity at institutions of higher education. So the, an accountability system that is based on student outcome metrics risks, you know, uh, you know, hurting institutions or penalizing institutions for the kinds of students that they enroll because of this correlation with demographics um, and or, or for being open access uh, or less selective. And that's a hard thing to solve for. Um, I think, you know, many of my friends on the left have solved for it by saying, let's just apply it to for-profit colleges. That's how they solve for it. Uh, and, and, and let's find a way to let, have it applied to for-profit colleges and not apply to publics. So you can see, you can see this tension, for example, um, I watched some colleagues at a left-leaning think tank try to develop a, uh, an accountability plan that included risk sharing uh, for student loan, unpaid student loans. And they realized when they first ran the numbers that they were going to um, penalize a lot of community colleges. 
because they had low loan repayment. And there was a lot of hand wringing over that. So they said, okay, well, what if we give schools a bonus for enrolling low income students and minority students? And then they realized, well, that wouldn't work because for profit colleges would get a lot of bonuses because they enroll a lot of low income students and a lot of minority students. They said, well, that's not what we're after. So they, so they settled on price. They said, oh, we'll give institutions a bonus for charging a low price um, because public institutions have lower prices. But my, you know, part of my issue is that, it, well, if, if it's a weak student outcome, it's hard for me to try to figure out what price is the right, what price is a low enough price to make a weak student outcome okay? Yeah. You know, uh, I've heard many, several college presidents say in can being candid and off the record uh, formats that the best way to improve their outcome, sadly, is to decrease the number of Pell eligible students they admit. Um, so it's it's a tricky problem. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah. let's. Uh, I want to turn it back to Steve. I know yeah. folks have been asking some good questions in the Q and A. So let's open it up. Tons of questions. And hey, I just want to say a shout out to Walter over at BES. How's it going, man? Thanks for the uh, questions here. Uh, Walter hit us with a bunch of them. I just want to be clear to everybody. There's a lot of people here with a lot of questions. We only got a limited amount of time. So in all fairness to everyone, I'm, I'm probably not going to answer everyone's all your questions, but I want to at least hit one from everybody. Uh, that I can. Uh, but we uh, would love to set up meetings. Donald, uh, our legislative director, would be super excited to meet with you guys. He's been uh, tracking and really familiar with the study and the methodology and would love to meet with you. And maybe we can even convince Jason to meet with you. Who knows? So uh, Walter and everybody, uh, if you have any other questions we don't get to, please follow up with us and we'll get you all connected. All right. So um, let's start Let's start with Walter. He, he, you know, he jumped in here first. So let's let's answer one of his questions uh, off the off the break here. Um, so Atis asked a number of the four private schools that your analysis identified as examples in terms of quality have settled lawsuits for misleading advertising and recruiting. Phoenix, AMU, uh, or, and Trident has been purchased by a company that settled multiple law lawsuits. The 910 lo loophole incentivized their predatory behavior, says Walter. Isn't this an argument for closing the loophole? Asks Walter. Yeah, uh, so I mean, look, we, you know, we're looking at our exercise here was to look at student outcome data. Um, and so we weren't counting number of times somebody settled a lawsuit or we aren't looking at accreditation. We're just looking at outcome. Um, so, you know, I, I think to the extent that those things are disqualifying and concerning to people, um, the lawsuits and, and violations by creditors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, but we're still seeing the outcomes data are the outcomes data. I mean, they still, you know, look similar or better than many public institutions. Um, so I, perhaps that's an argument for not using student outcome data and using other metrics, other things that are sort of soft metrics, but um, you know, I, I still think an accountability system um, that uses metrics is, is probably the best way to go. Uh, you know, and you can let the legal process, you know, do its thing. Um, all of that still exists, uh, but probably don't want to be making decisions uh, on whether or not you're eligible for federal aid based on the number of lawsuits that you settle, right? I mean, I think that's probably not a great Thanks, Jason. Um, hey, everyone, just so you know, there's a qu question and answer tab. Uh, try and get your uh, question, your questions in that, not in the chat. Um, but I do have a veteran here, and veterans in my uh, book always get preference. So sorry to anyone else. Uh, I'm going to let this guy jump the line a little bit. His name's Edward Mounts. Um, he said, as a veteran, I do have one question I do not believe was addressed in the research. Um, the politicians wish to include the Montgomery GI Bill um, as, um, uh, as part of the, uh, sorry, uh, funds which include benefits as federal funding. In my opinion, uh, they're missing a key point. Uh, as you guys know, the MGIB, you pay into, right? So uh, so he pays into, and he also, uh, this particular per, uh, person also um, added the kicker. Um, he says, uh, if they combine the uh, Montgomery GI Bill with other federal funding, then why shouldn't the institution get credit for the money that he put in himself? I mean, if we're moving, I, I, I think essentially, Edward, what you're asking is, is that 
if you're counting the, the entirety of the MGI b, uh, bill into the 90 side and not counting as out of pocket expenses, yet they did pay money out of pocket for that. Um, that does seem like they're missing something here. Would, would you uh, would you agree with that, Jason? Is there, or is that not true? Is that is that delineated? Well, I, you know, I mean, I think that's, you know, we talk about this a little bit in the paper. Um, I don't really have a dog in that fight. Um, but I mean, I'm willing to acknowledge that there's sort of, you know, there's two sides to that debate. And we've heard a lot from one side. Uh, and, you know, I think that the gentleman who's asking the question is giving us more of the other side, which hasn't been heard very much, which is, um, you know, these are, these are the GI Bill benefits, they're, they're, they're mine. Um, uh, and I earned them and I would like to use them where I want to use them, um, which, you know, I, which is different than this student loan is mine just because it's available to anybody. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't do what we ask, uh, people in, in the military to do and the kinds of risks that they take and the time, you know, the sacrifices and time commitment. Um, to earn their benefits. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm sympathetic to the view that it seems particularly bad to try to, to have, to try to limit choices then around those kind of benefits. I understand that there's a desire to protect recipients of these benefits from schools with, with you know, uh, troublesome student outcomes, but it should be one then that should be consistent across all the sectors. Yeah. Not, not across. That's good. All right, um, this is from an anonymous uh, source, so very spooky. Um, is there any input metric you think would be useful uh, for pairing with an analysis of outcomes for the purpose of weeding out uh, schools that do not serve students well, or are you only in favor of outcome-based accountability? Well, I mean, I think the outcomes are, are really, those should be the most important things. Um, I think if you start looking at inputs, um, well, I mean, look, I mean, this is why the, the reason why we ended up with the gainful employment regulations, those weren't input based from under the Obama administration. They were all about student earnings. Um, you know, it was good enough for them. Um, you know, I think it should be good enough, you know, for, for the rest of us and for the rest of the institutions and, and as the, as the sort of holy grail of the, of the, of the policy in terms of higher education accountability. I mean, it's sort of like, this was sort of the thrust of the papers. This is what we've always been after. We've always wanted to measure what people earn after they leave an institution of higher education. We just couldn't do it before. And so we've looked at, and policymakers looked at proxies. That's where, you know, student loan defaults. We're like, I don't know, is there something we can measure that might, get close to earnings? Well, I guess if you don't pay your student loan, your earnings must not be very good relative to what you borrowed. Okay, let's use that because we can't measure earnings. But if you can just do this directly, then I, I, think, that's, um, I think that's preferable. Uh, trying to, I mean, the, it, I don't know what you would be getting at if you're trying, this is probably my sort of like, I think the hidden agenda, if you try to measure inputs, you're really just looking for something, I think, people are really just looking for something that hurts for profits and leave the publics alone. Thanks, Jason. Um, all right, here we go. We got a two-parter from Joe here. Um, I have two questions. First, what kind of involvement or influence did VEP have over the study? Um, and then the second question, uh, not uh, connected at all, uh, but sure, uh, sure, some schools might close because of the rule change, but, there aren't, but aren't there still a ton of other options for them? So, you know, what's the problem there? Yeah. Uh, so first one on involvement, um, the way this worked is VEP um, called me up to talk about the existing literature uh, that there is on 9010 and just to get my take on it. And um, through those conversations, I mentioned, you know, holes that I, and, and sort of gaps that I thought there were, which I talked about earlier today, in the, in the work that's being done on, on 9010 and particularly with all the student outcome information. And so I said, here's, you know, I'm curious to know, I would like to know, I'm interested in learning these things. Uh, and VEP said, well, we would love to, to uh, support you in doing that. Um, but this is my name and my reputation on the paper. Um, so, you know, I made very clear at the outset, you know, that this can't be something where, 
uh, I'm sticking my name on somebody else's work. So this is very much so uh, my work with uh, my name on it. Um, and, you know, I mean, you can look, look, I mean, if you look at like the first table, for example, in this paper, um, well, actually, I should say, I, I actually talked to a, um, a, a lobbyist for a for-profit college uh, when, we, when we were, when I was developing the paper, um, who said, I don't think you should do that paper. And, uh, you know, so and I said, well, why? I said, well, it, it could make a lot of colleges look bad. And I said, well, uh, sure, you know, I said, so, so, and he said, that would be a bad strategy. Well, that's a, be a bad lobbying strategy. I think it would be a good research strategy. <laughs> uh, and to, to find out what the data say. And so like I said, if you look at the first table in our paper, um, you know, the outcomes among the for-profit colleges that are failing 90-10 are considerably weaker than they are at the institutions that pass it under these reforms. So, you know, we're certainly not, I'm not hiding anything or sort of pulling any punches here. Um, but uh, the, um, so, so that's a, you know, the data are the data and, you know, there wasn't any attempt to sort of make everything look a lot better than it really does. In fact, you can, you can pull down the whole spreadsheet itself. Very good. I, there was a follow-up question too in there. This is why you shouldn't ask these two part things, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the uh, follow-up question was, if some of these schools close, uh, yeah. who cares? There's 10 other schools for them to go to. So what's the big deal? Yeah. yeah, I mean, so look, I mean, I first of all, it would be really, I think it would be wrong and perverse to just say, who cares if a school closes, if it has okay outcomes or outcomes better than many problems. I mean, closing a school is a big deal. Uh, particularly if the outcomes were just as good as those at public colleges. And it also, just to throw in, it affects the students too. I mean, when a school yeah. closes, it's not an as easy transition. Seen, right? I mean, it, th that's, a lot of, that's a lot of chaos that it throws into a lot of people's lives, um, veterans and students. Um, so I wouldn't be too glib about, you know, closing the school. Um, but to the to the uh, to the point of well they could just go somewhere else. Um, um, I would say yeah, but and that was kind of the argument we were testing in this paper, which is if all the other options are are better, then then I then I buy that. But what we're showing in the data is that we've got over three hundred public institutions that don't that don't have better outcomes. And so why, so I'm, like I said, I'm less convinced that that's just automatically the case. And the other thing that we don't really even look at, we're just looking at numbers and outcomes here. We're not really looking at the types of programs. You know, so one of the institutions that we look at here um, uh, that is small and has excellent outcomes, for-profit institution, uh, they offer underwater welding training and certificates. And I just, you know, so whenever I hear someone say, can't they just go somewhere else? I think of this like highly specialized underwater welding program. Yeah, just go to the other one. <laughs> yeah, I, <don't, laughs> I mean, it's just right. Um, so, you know, I, that's, how the, that's the other thing too. We lose some of these numbers and averages, which is why in the, in the final table of the paper, we wanted to pull out a few institutions that are smaller. You know, and some people have said, well, you're cherry picking. Sure. But we, we did we cherry pick institutions with great outcomes that are gonna fail 90-10 if you make these reforms. So real institutions, real people that would fail this test and make a lot of business or may have to dramatically change how they operate because of an accounting rule. Yeah, J uh, Jason, just to, just to circle back what you just said again. Um, yes, you did cherry pick to highlight a few of the people that would fail, but the, your, your point being that the show and highlight that just because you fail doesn't mean you're a bad school. In fact, you could fail and in fact be a very good school and you wanted to show that. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, that's why we picked them. I mean, because again, the theory we were testing is, okay, if 90-10 only uh, uh, affects schools that have weak student outcomes, uh, you know, then not, okay, maybe, then maybe it's fine, you know? But that's not, that's not what it, that, that's, that's not the case. Right. Um, yeah. And so clearly not the case in those institutions. And 
you know, I'm sure there'll be some people in Washington or who say, you know, oh, well, these are small niche schools. Nobody's ever heard of them. Well, there's hundreds and hundreds of veterans that have heard of them because they're there. They're well, going to them. Um, and, you know, I think it, it's a sort of a, it's actually the kind of, th kind of thing why people don't like Washington. Right. People sit in Washington and say, ah, I never heard of you. Don't care. Going to close you down. Um, uh, you know, it's exactly the kind of thing I think we should be trying to prevent. All right. All right. Just we're going to go a little bit of lightning around here. Uh, you're doing a great job pontificating. Well, let's, uh, we'll try and get through some more of these. Questions. Yeah, I'll be faster. All right. Yeah. All right. Got all right, it. just just speak faster. Um, all right, <laughs> all right. Can you please explain? Um, just a data question. Can you please explain uh, for those listening that when adding uh, military benefits to nine ten calculation, how can revenue exceed one hundred percent? A few schools on the spreadsheet exceed one hundred percent revenue. How, how did that happen? Yeah, I mean, we you know these are the numbers that come down that we pull down, and we we didn't want to mess with them. Um, so some of them, yeah, do in fact uh, exceed 100%. Um, you know, it, it's hard to know exactly why. If you look at, for example, the Brookings Institution study, that is another study on 9010, uh, you can see in some of the notes and the methodology, a lot of schools exceed um, 100% under that study as well. So we took some comfort in that the Brookings Institution study is widely cited among the advocacy, advocacy communities. Um, and has the same problems. And so it is an issue with the data um, that, that we're working with. Okay, great. Um, I, I got a few questions here uh, that we're not gonna touch on um, that are more about opinions about uh, what should be done to make sure this isn't added to the bill um, or what our opinions are about uh, veterans and limiting their choice. That really isn't what Jason's here to talk about. Jason is a data study guy and he's here to talk about the study not as much about lobbying and the political football that's happening so i'm going to shield jason from those questions but i would love to answer those questions and i know my legislative director donald would so please email us connect with us and we'd love to talk to you about that um so i just want to address that um i have someone here another spooky anonymous person uh here who asks so the dep report uh claims that and they're talking about a specific school for some reason uh, that Trident University, I guess we'll find out. Trident University, among other for-profit schools, is, quote, popular with military students. It adds that Trident and other reports uh, exceptional student outcomes. As you know, Trident is part of the American Intercontinental University System, which has received a flurry of complaints from uh, students and then flagged by VA's GI Bill comparison tool, for, among other things, settling with the FTC. In light of this information, why does the VEP report boost Trident standings is it all, um, so, and then he asks, is this explained by the fact, Jason, obviously you're not gonna know the answer to this one. Uh, is it all explained by the fact that one of VEP's major partners, CCME, is overseen by the number of senior Trident officials? Um, so. Um, yeah, well, it can't be that, cause I, that's, you know, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> so I, yeah, so why don't you talk about- I don't have why, time to figure all that out. Well, why don't you talk the methodology of why you yeah, chose yeah, yeah. you chose uh, and Trident specific? Yeah, so I mean, those are the numbers. I mean, look, you can you can look at Trident's outcome numbers in that spreadsheet, you know, based on those four metrics that we pulled down from the college scorecard. They look pretty darn good. Um, so now the the person asking the question says, yeah, but there's all these other problems um, at Trident, and th there may be. Um, I mean, our goal was to measure the student outcomes. Um, you know, so despite all of those problems that this individual is pointing out, um, the institution is still producing really good student outcomes. Um, and um, I, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't just dismiss them, you know? Um, so, uh, I mean, that's why Trident's in there. I mean, in fact, I'll be honest with you, um, when we ran these numbers, I'd never heard of Trident University before, I'm sorry, Trident. <laughs> uh, I, didn't know, I didn't know what it was. Uh, and we ran these numbers and pulled us up. I'm like, what's going on with this school? Look, look at the, wow. Um, so I think that's, you know, but if, if the concern is, if the argument then is that student, schools can have good student outcomes, but have other, have all sorts of problems that makes their good student outcomes move. Well, then we shouldn't use student outcomes to measure schools, um, which means we can't use gainful employment anymore. Right, because that's an outcome test. We shouldn't use cohort default, right? You know, so uh, you know, I, it's sort of like 
yes, I will die on the hill of student outcomes are something we should use in measuring um, institutions. And I will not go along with, you're not gonna get me to agree to let's not use them um, because the schools have other problems. All right, um, so Waylon said, uh, he mentioned uh, that, you, that you did say, hey, um, 9010 uh, is in some ways a good indicator of outcomes, as you pointed out. Um, sometimes it can predict uh, worse outcomes. So he says, so why, why change the rule? Um, Outcome-based uh, metrics are variable and often environmental. So maybe uh, touch on, uh, you know, about the problems of outcome data as well. Um, and then if you do actually think 9010 is a good indicator, what, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, so, the, the problem with 9010 is it, it doesn't have anything to do with outcome. You can, it correlates um, with weaker outcome as the Brookings Institution study shows. And as we also show in running the numbers complete in a completely with a different data set. Um, but the, the problem is like that we pointed out is that we don't need to be in a world anymore where we where we should settle for, well, on average, it's pretty good, right? 90-10 on average is pretty good at finding these kinds of institutions because we know we can actually look at that specific outcome rather than do 90-10. We can just say, look, if, if an institution where median student earnings six years after enrolling is below $20,000, if that's unacceptable to you, then say that's unacceptable and then hold the institution to that, to that standard. Um, so I, you know, I, I think that that's available. And the other thing is that we know from this report that 9010 um, institutions can run afoul of 9010 when military benefits are added that have really good outcomes. We know for a fact that that would happen. Um, and that's a bad thing. And so we, we should be real. I, I'm really concerned about that, you know, that that would happen. Um, and so, it's why I wouldn't use 9010. And in fact, like I said, you don't need to use 9010 if you already have the outcome data. 9010 was created at a time when we didn't have any of this data. Um, and now we do. And so let's let's do away with the, the proxies for student outcomes. Really good. All right, we're uh, coming coming down the home stretch here. Again, I wanna try and uh, answer as many questions as we can. Um, so I got, you were talking about the data sets a second ago um, and how they're a little bit different from Brookings. Um, Walter, I'm gonna get, Walter asked so many, I, I get to circle back to another one from Walter. Um, he said, who is including the graduation rate metric you used? Does a metric include all students such as those who had enrolled part-time or had earned some prior college credits? What is that? And then, um, and then maybe talk about what the, when you said the two different data sets from Brookings, um, explain what you meant when you said that. What's the difference there? So I'll start with the Brookings one. Um, Brookings uses data from um, what's called the IPEDS data set um, that the Department of Education collects. Institutions themselves report this data. What Adam Mooney did at Brookings was use the, that data and reconstruct a 9010 ratio for every institution, public, private, and for profit. Um, what we did instead was we went and we looked at the 9010 data that the um, that the Department of Education has. So Department of Education already has how much revenue for profit is only for profit institutions are receiving from federal aid and non federal aid. So we use that to construct our list. The reason why the Brookings Institution paper uses um, uses iPads uh, is that he, he's interested in all institutions, not just for profits. Well, the Department of Education hasn't calculated a 9010 for public institutions. So when we, so, so we weren't interested in which, which publics would fail a hypothetical 9010, we were interested in which of the for profits would fail it. So that allows us to use only the 9010 data from the department. We didn't have to use the iPads data like Brookings did. Jason, uh, can you also just touch on that, that data set? I, I know because we were thinking about launching a little bit earlier and then all of a sudden new data came out and we redid the whole study all over again. You wanna talk about that story a little bit? Right, so we used, so we were using college scorecard data and you know that was updated recently. And so we had already done the study with the uh, prior year's college scorecard data. And so we updated it to include the 
the new the new data. Uh, uh, and and of course my my my. My, you know, my friends at, at Veterans Education Project were saying, geez, I don't, is that really going to change it? I said, probably not. <laughs> no. um, it's not going to matter that much, uh, you know, especially particularly we're dealing with averages. Where it does matter actually a little bit, and this is, a, this is an important thing. This is actually kind of a caveat with using outcomes data. You have institutions with small numbers of students uh, and small cohorts. Um, every year could be really different. You know, so we saw some institutions in the data that, um, you know, in one year, their cohort default rate was 4%, which is outstanding. You know, that's like some of the, that's like the, one of the lowest default rates you can get, you know, you see in, in some of the data. Uh, and then the next year it was 17%. And, and you say, gee, well, one of those must be wrong. No, there's just, they just don't have a lot of students. So it doesn't take too many to, you know, to, to throw the number off, which is, uh, you know, maybe something we should think more about in terms of how much faith we, we pin on the data, maybe talk about averaging them or you know, something like that. I mean, sort of, that's a somewhat more easy thing to do. Um, so, yeah, so, so we, updated, we updated the data. What was the, there was an earlier question that I missed uh, that I skipped over, I'm sorry. You can remind me of it if, if you- uh, Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh... The uh, question was about uh, where did you pull like the the uh, graduation rates? Oh, the graduation uh, rates. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, that's but you included that metric. Good question, and so I, I didn't didn't want to completely forget about it. Um, so when you you could go to VP's website, and there is a link to download our spreadsheet, which has all of which has you know the results from the calculations that we did. And it also has a link, has a tab for glossary, and it tells you um, uh, what data we did, what actual variable we used in the college scorecard data for the study, and it takes and a link to it. For graduation, for completion rates, we use the standard, what is the most standard one, or at least has been heretofore, uh, which is the, I believe it's 150% on-time completion for first time full-time. So no, it doesn't include the, the non-traditional um, or, or, or part-time students. Um, you could do that. You could put that in. You could run that yourself. Um, it might change it. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't scrutinize it too heavily. We sort of relied on all four outcomes. And um, our goal was mainly to look at a variety of outcomes rather than try to develop the single best, most inscrutable outcome metric. Um, so, and that is, you know, we do talk about it in the paper, that is one of the interesting things, the, the best outcomes, uh, you know, some of the best outcomes are on those completion rates among the for-profit institutions and much better than the publics. That may be because of this first-time, full-time issue, um, but, uh, and certainly something worth looking at, but it's also, I mean, you know, you, anecdotally, if you talk to people you know, who go to some public college and they're like, geez, I just was lost. I didn't know who to talk to. Seems like nobody cared. I didn't know how to fill this form out. And so, and then, you know, I couldn't get any questions answered. And, you know, I know there's a lot of sort of bashing of for-profits about how aggressive they are in recruiting people, but I think there's high correlation between aggressively recruiting people and, and wanting them to enroll and stay enrolled and maybe then them finishing. Nice. All right. Well, that is all the time we got uh, for this. Uh, thank everyone for their questions. Thank you for, for attending. Paul, thank you so much for, for uh, hosting and uh, asking some hard questions. And, uh, and Jason, thank you so much for all you are doing and uh, for being here to explain everything you guys are doing. Everyone, yeah, yeah absolutely. And uh, everyone, you know, Donald and I put our, our emails um, here. Reach out to us. Um, if you have more questions, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, as you can imagine, this last week has been kind of crazy for us, but uh, we'll be back uh, on, on comms here in the next uh, next couple of days. So reach out anytime we'll be here and uh, maybe you can ring little Jason in as well. So uh, let us know. And we love that. Uh, Paul, Jason, you got any uh, parting uh, comments? Paul, you got anything? Thanks for having me. It's fun. Good work, Jason. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Paul.